Um, so yeah, I'm Mary Maluccio. I'm the medical director of the neuroendocrine program in New Orleans. And the, the curse of, um, the, the curse of deciding to move a program uh, from one health system to another one, but you just have to trust me, it was the, it was the right thing to do. So um, we, are, uh, we are just trying to, to determine um, the difference between the, the program that we, where the health system that we used to be in. So within the neuroendocrine community, um, we see patients from all over the country, but predominantly we are responsible for the southern part of the country and call patients from Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, the Florida Panhandle, and parts of Georgia and East Texas. So a shout out to any of you that, that come from the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so so um, when I took over directorship of this program around three years ago, one of my main goals was to bring clinical trials to a part of the country that has really been left out of those types of things in the, in the past. And I cannot reiterate enough how much clinical trials and new therapies are important for rare cancers because often what is, um, what is available in a clinical trial is better than, than what we have off the shelf. So I was tasked with, um, with talking about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It's, this is actually usually not my talk, but, um, but I, I certainly um, have uh, given a talk looking at pancreas with respect to comparing it to other parts of the body. So my objectives for this, and just to let everyone know, I don't have any disclosures. So my objectives for the talk is to, is to explain to you um, what variables weigh most heavily into surgical decisions in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. For those of you then that have pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it's kind of what you're reading on your pathology report or what you're reading on your operative report or what information you're asking from your medical provider that would actually weigh into the, to the decisions or the advice that they're giving. I want to highlight the unique challenges to pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor for which a second opinion is often recommended. What data supports surgery as a treatment option? We have to remember that surgery is one of a multitude of treatment options, and it's really important to understand where surgery fits in that algorithm. And in pancreas in particular, this, this, um, this word morbidity, morbidity means the complication associated with the treatment. What is it and why does it matter? Because it's actually really important in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So you heard a lot about, about grade. So in neuroendocrine in general, grade is often more important than stage. So I know that Del Rivero and Blakely both talked about the, the grade of a tumor and the stage of the tumor but that you can have a low-grade stage four neuroendocrine tumor, perhaps of the mid-gut, that will do better than a lower stage, higher grade tumor. So when we're talking about the KI-67 proliferation in index, that's probably one of the most important things to pick out on the pathology report. That means that a pathologist is looking under the microscope and saying, hey, how many of the cells under the microscope are dividing like cancer cells do versus not dividing like normal cells? Okay? So the lower the grade, the lower number of cells that are trying to divide, then the less aggressive and more predictable biologic behavior that has. The differentiation status, they also um, uh, commented on that. If it's well differentiated, that means you're looking under the same microscope and you're saying, Mr. Pathologist, how much do these look like normal intestinal neuroendocrine, normal lung neuroendocrine, normal pancreatic neuroendocrine cells versus crazy cancer cells? The more normal the cells look, the more likely they will behave like normal tumors. Now, when they're functional, that normalcy can actually lead to significant uh, neuroendocrine syndrome. And then the lower grade, well differentiated tumors have a more predictable biologic behavior and therefore a lot of the data that supports what it is we do is going to be based on, on grade. So the three main questions when someone comes in to, to the office and we're looking at a, at a case and surgeons are really qu relatively simple people is that we're really looking at can all measurable disease be removed. Now, I'm here to tell you, just like Dr. Blakely did, is that you can have a survival benefit even if all measurable disease can't be removed. But the idea would be that if all measurable disease can be, can be removed, that would ultimately be our goal. And we would be looking at primary, with or without, 
the addition of the metastatic disease? Is it unifocal, ver unifocal versus multifocal in that primary site? The extent of lymph node involvement that would come out with the specimen and the extent of metastatic disease, okay? Then we've got to look at question number two. What are the risks associated with that operation? For which, yeah, the risks associated with a pancreas operation are very different than the risks that are associated with an intestinal uh, operation. And in that case, location, just like Dr. Blakey said, location within the, within the small bowel mesentery or in the pancreas, the location within the pancreas totally matters. And do you have other medical conditions or a surgical history that would impact your ability to recover from whatever operation we're, we're proposing? Dr. Blakey mentioned it. Is it a trade-off of one problem, a slow-growing tumor, for another problem that you would then have to live for with the rest of, uh, of your life? So is the treatment more life-limiting than the natural history or the expected biologic behavior of the disease? So I think it's really important to come out of these conferences understanding the language that we use so that then when you are, are getting opinions from a medical doctor, you will be able to better um, ask the appropriate questions that are going to put things in perspective for you. So when we say that something is with curative intent, regardless of the cancer you're talking about, that means that the procedure is meant to give you every opportunity to be cured, eliminate this diagnosis from your life for the rest of your life. So if you're doing something with curative intent in colon cancer or curative intent in, in breast cancer, you are trying to eliminate that diagnosis from the equation. But everyone that's on a support group or has a relative with cancer understands that that curative intent does not necessarily take away from the possibility of something coming back, a recurrence, and therefore having to, um, to go back onto therapy or need additional surgery. But curative intent means that we are trying to remove all residual disease and eliminate it as a variable. Palliative intent is actually important in neuroendocrine too, because as you heard, you have a lot of the syndromic type problems, and so you can do something where it's not necessary to remove all measurable disease, but it is used to try to alleviate symptoms associated with the disease. So if you've got that goal in mind, all you need to do is identify what symptom are you trying to alleviate, and if you have alleviated that symptom, you have met your treatment goal, regardless of whether or not that is associated with a survival benefit. But I can tell you, in neuroendocrine, a lot of us believe, although we have not yet completely proven, but that if you can successfully palliate some significant symptoms associated with this disease, it is associated with a survival benefit. That's a lot of the data that drives surgical site reduction. So you need to alleviate some symptoms and or you have to diminish the side effects of anticipated progression of disease. Like, oh my gosh, if that were to grow in that location, that may cause X, Y, and Z problems. And that is also an operation that's done with palliative intent. So typical things are going to be obstruction, bleeding, syndrome, or a location whereby growth in that location may cause significant other problems. And then there are surgeries that are done with prolongation of, of life, where the likelihood of the tumor coming back over the course of a remaining lifetime is a measurable number, but that when successful, the procedure is associated with a longer expected survival compared to no procedure or medical therapy alone. So surgery done with, with curative intent. I have some of these this because this is the, the slides that I took from a talk where I had I actually did one on all surgical therapies. The, the lunges are just examples of where it, it pertains to what Dr. Blakely talked about. So in local disease with no evidence of distant metastatic involvement, surgery done with curative intent would be you're taking a pancreas resection with all of the pancreatic lymph node basins and eliminating all measurable disease. Or you can do limited metastatic disease can be repeatedly removed, and that's when the pancreas primary has lymph nodes that extend outside of the peripancreatic area, but can be encompassed when the with this in the same operation. But that would be outside of the typical resection that we would do. Surgery done with palliative intent would be if you have a functional p -net with syndrome. That's actually really important. Dr. Del Rivera said about the importance of insulinomas 
the consequences of an insulinoma can actually kill you more than the tumor growing in any particular space. So a functional PMET with syndrome of which the most um, significant are going to be a gastronoma that can give you bleeding ulcers, a glucagonoma that can give you this horrible migra migratory um, rash, and insulinomas that can give you these crashes of hypoglycemia. Renewing tumors with, lo with the location is associated with pain. That can be large pancreatic tumors. I'm going to show you some pictures where the pancreas lies that can cause symptoms just because of the space where it grows, and or large liver tumors, and in syndromic patients with liver, liver involvement, whereby removing it is more likely to uh, be able to remove the, the pain associated with growth in that area. Tumors causing instruction. I'm going to show you a picture of where, depending on where it is in the pancreas, you can have significant obstruction of food coming out of your, of your stomach or obstruction of the bile duct coming from your, from your liver to that portion of your um, intestine. And then intestinal bleeding is one of those where we very rarely have really good options short of surgery, although some of the interventional techniques that we may hear about later on this afternoon can also be used to try to palliate that symptom. And then Dr. Blakely mentioned surgical uh, cytoreduction or surgical debulking. We have all come with an, a, sort of an agreement that, that in order to have that be associated with a significant um, outcome benefit, survival benefit, or delay in progression, we have to have some critical mass of the tumor burden removed. And we have put that at 70 percent. That doesn't mean that there's some magic to 69 versus 71. It's just that if you're looking at the images and say, hey, I'm not going to meet the 70 percent, then we would usually have to go with other of the treatment options and then save surgery for a time when we can meet that treatment goal in order to have the investment in the surgery be worth it to the patient. So we need to know how much tumor we have and where it is and can we meet that treatment goal and then can we do it safely whereby the complications of the, the case itself are not then going to change the, um, the outcome or the symptoms or the consequences of the, of the operation over the course of what can be a very long life. And in PNET, just to let you know, I know that Dr. Blakely mentioned it, but that, that now there are many papers coming, coming out about the use of surgical cytoreduction in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It's probably one of the things that we debate at almost every physician national uh, meeting, but that you can get a survival benefit to surgical cytoreduction even if it does not include taking out the primary in pancreatic. I don't think that's the same in, in mid-gut, but this is about pancreatic. So pancreas anatomy. So the pancreas is like a fish. It actually sits in your back, just anterior to your vertebral body. And so it is in a bit of what we call tiger country. So you've got a head of the fish, you've got a neck of the fish, a body of the fish, and the tail of the fish. Okay? This is that, that same picture, and this is all the lymph nodes that are draining in that area that would come out if you were to cut the fish in the head, neck, body, or tail. And then the tail is going to tuck in to the hilum of the spleen here. So this is just a picture from one of our atlases to show you how that relationship is into this huge big blood vessel called your aorta here. These are the blood vessels that are going over here to the spleen. This is the stomach here. This is the stomach as it's coming out. You've got the C loop of the duodenum. So the pancreas is sitting almost like a fist, sitting in a, a fist of clay. And therefore, if you were to look at the head of the fish, that relationship between the head of the fish and all of those things makes resections of the head of the pancreas very challenging. Where if you think about a fish at the little fishmonger place and you were to say, oh, how is it you know, to take off the tail? Tail has its own unique issues, but the, the tail is associated with less tiger country. So the types of pancreatic surgery that I was going to go over with you, just so that you can understand the nomenclature, you have a classic Whipple procedure. That's also called a pancreatic oduodenectomy. You have a pylorus sparing Whipple procedure. I'll explain some of the reasons why we do that. Distal pancreatectomy with or without taking the spleen, a central pancreatectomy, and a tumor nucleation. So the classic Whipple procedure is where you have the liver here, you've got the gallbladder, you've got the bile duct, it's all coming down here, and you've got a tumor that is sitting in the head of the pancreas. 
So how do you get all of that stuff out of there, okay, and then put it back together? So this is the classic Whipple where we take part of the stomach here. It comes out all together with the bile duct, the gallbladder, the head of the pancreas, the C loop of the duodenum, and this little point here, and you've cut the pancreas across pretty much the demarcation between the head and the neck. So if I were to go back to this. This is that you are taking it right here, where right at the this side of these blood vessels here. Okay, and then you're going to have a whole bunch of things. So now I've got an end of the stomach, I've got an end of the bile duct, and I've got the end of the pancreas with this duct in it, and that duct is responsible for bringing all those really, really irritating enzymes that are that like burn the back of your throat when you throw up. So I've got to then put all those things back together. So you're going to bring this small intestine up here, and you're going to loop it all up here. We call that the afferent limb. And then you're going to have to sew the pancreas onto the intestine, the bile duct onto the intestine, and you see this little stomach here onto the intestine. But that in taking that portion of the intestine, you've lost this little pylorus, this little valve that keeps the food in your stomach and lets you churn, churn, churn it like a, like a cow. And so the problems that you will have after a classic Whipple is that the food will go too quickly into your intestine and your intestine is sitting there saying, whoa, Jack, isn't the stomach supposed to keep this a little bit longer? Like, why am I getting this under-digested food in the intestine too early? You can get bloated, you can actually feel like you're getting carcinoid syndrome, lightheaded palpitations, uh, uh, flushing. But the, the classic Whipple is often necessary if you have a higher grade tumor or a large tumor sitting where you just can't save the valve that connects the stomach into the first portion of your, of your duodenum. So the recommendations for it are all gonna sound very much the same. Dumping syndrome, you have to eat small, more frequent meals. Your days of eating cheesecake are probably gone. And you have to drink less water with meals because you don't wanna flush the underdigested food downstream uh, too quickly. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to make that opening um, a little bit, you know, smaller than this, but that at the end of the day without the valve, you, you will lose your ability to have the stomach be a containment. Pylorus bearing whipples are, the reason why I bring it up is that we will often try to do this in neuroendocrine because neuroendocrine tumors tend to be pushing tumors, not invading tumors. And so you're ending up saving the, the pylorus here. So you see this little valve here and then you've got this little lip. And so all of the rest of the operation looks exactly the same, but that you're saving that, that valve and therefore you are saving the churning mechanism of the stomach. The problem with doing that is in the process of taking out all of those central structures, you will get delayed gastric emptying because your stomach is like, I think that I lost my ability to push things out at the same rate. And so people will get bloated and, um, and like the food stays there a little bit too, too long and they can complain of nausea. Now I want to say that, that the data on the difference between the two procedures um, at around six weeks is that the people with the dumping will usually see it get better over six weeks and the people with the delayed gastric emptying will, will have it get better over the six weeks. And so if the, the surgeon is talking to you about one or the other case, I, I don't think that's the hill to die on. It's just that it's trying to prepare patients what, for, for what the post-op recovery may look like. So these people have to eat small, more frequent meals. That's pretty much the neuroendocrine mantra, small, more frequent meals. Sometimes you will need liquid nutritional supplements like an Ensure or a smoothie type thing with the addition of, of um, a supplement because the stomach empties liquids much more efficiently than it empties um, solids. And then you have to drink more water with meals because the water will sort of help the, the food get out of the, of the stomach. So a distal pancreatectomy and, and splenectomy. So this is where you are tanging it from the body or the tail of the pancreas, and this is its relationship to the spleen. So this upper thing is where you will just come across at sort of the, the neck body or the body tail part of the, 
of the pancreas. You aren't in tiger country. You aren't in where you have to take out all these central things and try to attach a bunch of things um, on. It's a much easier um, operation. And so your tumor's here, and you are taking out, and there will be times when we have to take the spleen. If the tumor, so that, that part of the pancreas is laying on top of the blood vessels that are coming from these central structures to the spleen. And so depending on the location of the tumor or how it's wrapped around those vessels, sometimes the sparing of the spleen is just not worth it, and it actually makes the operation more risky. So we aren't going to cry any tears over losing the spleen in an adult population. Most of the immune function of the, of the adult comes from your peripheral you know, immunity, but that the, um, the spleen has some minor immunologic effects on um, certain types of organisms like uh, meningitis. So splenic preservation, though, if you were to look at neuroendocrine tumors, in particular low-grade neuroendocrine tumors, our goal actually is to to preserve the spleen and therefore not put you at even one iota of risk of any weird meningitis type you know, uh, immunity. So in order to do that, you then need to peel this thing. You're still taking the pancreas off of here. And then under these really, really friggin' awesome techniques, you can often literally just choop, 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 and you get it all the way off those splenic vessels. And this is what it looks like, is you've got all the splenic vessels he here, the, the, the proximal pancreas is here, and the spleen is there. There's the artery. There's the vein. Now, they are kind of flapping in the breeze, so we put a bunch of this little soft tissue back there too, to, um, uh, to cover all those exposed vessels. So splenic preserving um, pancreatectomies are, are really considered a standard for patients that are having a, a distal pancreatectomy for a low-grade pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumor unless there is clear involvement of those those uh, splenic vessels. So if someone is just willy-nilly taking the spleen, then I usually will say, hey, why not get a, a second opinion? Many of these cases, probably at least 80% of the cases are done with robotic or minimally invasive techniques. And so therefore, I think that people have become less inclined to save the spleen because it's just an easier operation robotically to just take the, the spleen. But at the end of the day, even robotic surgeons are leaning towards, uh, towards splenic preservation in low-grade neuroendocrine tumors. Now, some of the issues that someone can have after a distal uh, pancreatectomy is that the closer you get to the head of the pancreas, the larger that duct is. And so we are trying to seal that duct with a stapling device that's got a reinforced load that tries to almost, you know, close it off, but that there will be times when it will weep the fluid out of here instead of going into the intestine, which is this direction, that can cause a pancreatic pseudocyst. And it, um, it's just one of the most common complications after a, a distal pancreatectomy, highly unlikely to lead to significant issues long term, but it can be a real nuisance for patients. And then a central pancreatectomy, I would love you to just take, like, take this whole slide like out of your memory bank. So please call me if anyone uh, is recommending a central pancreatectomy for you. So a central pancreatectomy is when the tumor is unfortunately located in the neck of the pancreas, which is right over these, these vessels. And so in losing the distal pancreas, you lose some of your insulin producing cells and therefore have at least some risk of either poking the bear of diabetes or having someone have glucose control issues. So it's really sad to have to sacrifice the, the tail of the pancreas in order to get a, a tumor out of the neck, because that we call that a distal subtotal pancreatectomy. But your only other choice is to do an extended Whipple, which is even worse, because then you're taking the head and all of that, and then the duct, the farther it gets to the tail, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So getting that, that pancreas onto there is through a tiny, little duct and therefore your pancreatic fistula rate or that anastomosis not sealing is really high. 
So if you were to look at the potential morbidity, that's the complications of some of the, the cases that we do, the morbidity of a central pancreatectomy is higher than the complication rate of either a Whipple or a distal pancreatectomy. So I'm not saying that we never do it. I'm just saying that if things are in the neck of the pancreas, you really have to look at the risk benefit of the operation. And if you're going into a central pancreatectomy, they need to explain that that is a very challenging, it's one of the, the most complicated cases that we do in the pancreas, and it's got the, the highest you know, problematic rate. I can reassure you that I believe that there are going to be techniques coming down the pike that will be less invasive, if not non-invasive techniques for taking care of the small tumors sitting in the neck of the, the, the pancreas. And so, once again, someone says the word central pancreatectomy, you said, I think I need a second opinion. <clears throat> and then tumor enucleation is also something that is not used very often because it's only relevant in tumors that we actually consider non-invasive. So the, the sort of the prototype for tumor enucleation will be an insulinoma. Insulinomas, although they absolutely 100% can metastasize, they are often small, they are often non-invasive, they like will sit in the pancreas and they will spew out uh, insulin like a factory and it causes people to have significant issues with hypoglycemia. The issues with insulinomas is actually not that that tumor has a high likelihood of spreading all over your body. The problem with that tumor is that it's spewing out the insulin and that's gonna kill you. So in insulinomas, we will try to enucleate them out. We will also try to enucleate something out of the, the neck of the gland if it's if we can spare someone a central pancreatectomy. So enucleation is predominantly with functional tumors and or insulinomas where you don't feel that the goal of the surgery is actually to, to um, take a significant amount of the gland in order to get a margin. The goal of the surgery is actually just to remove a functional tumor so that the patient does not have problems with the syndrome. They are usually low grade and the location has to be away from the duct so that you can't really enucleate something if you are going to get too close to the duct because then you get leaking of the pancreatic juice out of the hole that is left behind. So sometimes what we do is we have a bunch of techniques and we have this to seal and all this stuff that we use in the operating room to try to help that seal. And then often, once again, we will use some of your natural soft tissue, like your fatty tissue or your this part of your old belly button area, and we will literally stuff it in the hole to try to, uh, to, to make sure that that seals so that you don't get a pancreatic fistula. So if you were to look up tumor enucleation of the pancreas, I promise you one of the first things on there is gonna be pancreatic fistula rates. That's when the, when the juice leaks out of the hole instead of going through the, through the duct. And this is pretty much what it is. I mean, it's actually a really sweet case. So they are really, really hard to do with minimally invasive techniques. So they usually have to be done open, but that when they are successful, you lose virtually no functioning uh, pancreas and they can be highly successful. I would not do a tumor enucleation in a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor unless I have a PET scan um, confirming that it's got a single site and is not multifocal. So, Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, what information then becomes really important? So functional versus non-functional. So we talked about how the number of, of um, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or the percentages that are functional. It is very difficult to leave someone with a functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, the consequences of the hyperinsulinoma, the, hy the hypergastrin or the hyperglucagon can be a significant problem, meaning it can, it can poke the bear of other medical problems and actually be a greater driver of mortality than the neuroendocrine tumor itself. So. So understanding whether or not something is functional versus non-functional, usually you know it's functional because, uh, because of the symptoms that you're having. Size is really important because some of the debates and controversies of how we manage low-grade, small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors have really le um, sort of leaned towards non-surgical or non-aggressive surgical management for small uh, uh, tumors. So the size we usually use is, is it less than one to two centimeters or is it greater than two centimeters?
The relationship to adjacent structures, like the duodenum, bile duct, or, or blood vessels, you gotta know where it lies within the pancreas to better understand the type of procedure that is necessary. You need the grade and the differentiation. We talked about that. You need to understand the intensity. That's how hot it is on the PET scan, how I, how I describe the PET scan to patients is that it's like injecting with a bunch of little cars with a pizza delivery light on top of it. It is searching your entire body for the receptor or the parking space on top of these cells. It sends off a signal that says, here I am, here I am. And, and therefore, if it is super intense, then that would suggest that that receptor is well preserved. And therefore, when you are talking about surgery versus non-surgical management, we may decide to target that receptor with the injections that we give patients every every month instead of doing a surgery that's associated with a lot of morbidity and as long as it's intense on SSR PET we have some confidence that 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 targeting that receptor would work the location totally matters the head is tough the tail is easy the neck is horrible and the body usually goes with the tail and then is it limited to the pancreas plus nodes versus being metastatic, because I'm gonna go on to some of the debates and controversies on the management of metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So, the issue with metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors is that, that um, medicine is not all about mandates, and it is not all about following a yellow brick road where you can go to one center or another center, and we're all playing by the same rules. No, we have guidelines, and as Dr. Blakely said, a lot of what we do is in the eye of the beholder. So, um, so there are no standards. So just if, if someone has metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you can say this, and you can say, I can almost guarantee you that we will have to dip into the pocket of one or another of these treatment um, options for you over the course of what we hope will be a very long life. So if it's likely to require multimodality treatment strategies, Dr. Blakely said, you can't like burn the bridge of, of another treatment by being overly aggressive with surgery or over aggressive with PRT or whatever it is. So liver is the likely driver of mortality. So we do tend to focus on control of the liver, whether or not it be with surgical or some of the non-surgical techniques that I think we're gonna learn about this afternoon, but that you have to then save some of your bullets because if you need to then treat the, the liver with other therapies, then you have to understand, well, what are you doing um, surgically? Patient selection is super duper important meaning that the other medical conditions that people bring to the plate, very important. So the morbidity of resection of the metastatic disease with or without the potential primary site. So if you were to talk about the, the data, what is the evidence that supports surgical cytoreduction in metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor? It is in low grade, meaning grade one or two. Our center published a, a paper on a thousand, a thousand cases that they did surgical cytoreduction, and of those thousand, th there were literally only like 10% of the entire thousand were grades that were higher than grade one or grade two. So it doesn't mean that we never do it. A lot of the higher grades we will do with palliative intent, but that the strongest data is gonna be in low grade tumors where you can, you can debulk greater than 70% of the total tumor burden, and that tumor burden does not necessarily involve the primary site. So we just looked over around 486 of our patients that we've done over the last 10 years. And what we found was that it was actually the liver. So we do a lot of surgical cytoreduction in the liver. And it was actually our ability to debulk greater than 70% of the liver disease that was associated with a survival benefit, meaning that the patients that underwent surgical cytoreduction or could undergo surgical cytoreduction did better than those that that um, could not as long as we met this, this treatment goal, but we did not actually prove that removing of the primary was part of that equation. So I think that that goes back to the fact that if you do a big liver operation and a big node operation and a big pancreas operation, oftentimes it becomes a mega big operation associated with a lot of complications. So it's not to say that we would, we would not approach the primary, it's just that you would say, what is our goal? Our goal is to ultimately take out the life-limiting disease that's in the liver. 
So it's really, really important. That's why I really like these um, these patient advocacy conferences is because we all in neuroendocrine understand that nothing we bring to the table is mutually exclusive. You can use things alone and in, in combination. So this is the menu that I will put in almost every single note, even if none of those things actually are relevant to the patient that I'm looking at. But because if someone lives a really long time with neuroendocrine, we may have to go back to the menu. So if I can get their head around the menu right from the very beginning, I will then go and say, oh, this is why we're doing this one. This is why we're not doing this one. This is why we should consider this one in the future. And this is one where if such and such and such were happen, we would have to consider that. But the, the reason why it's important to know the menu is because that's how neuroendocrine subspecialty programs can better educate the, the non-neuroendocrine um, community on, on why did we make one decision in this patient when you didn't make that decision in this one and they, seem sim they seemingly are so similar and you're like, yeah, that's because they aren't because there are particular things about that, that case, and that's one of the things that we struggle with in neuroendocrine, which is why we believe that the neuroendocrine subspecialty centers are so important. So if you were to look at the, the things, so somatostatin receptor inhibitor therapies, the way I describe that to people, I use my little car analogy again. So it's a little car, and it's driving over your entire body, looking for the same parking space, the somatostatin receptor, like a police officer putting on a, a boot on the car, it's trying to cripple the cell. It's trying to keep the, the cell from spewing out the stuff that's giving you symptoms, and it's trying to mess with the mechanisms by which that cell divides. So if you have a pet avid, a somatostatin receptor avid tumor, then somatostatin receptor inhibitors would be considered a standard of care, regardless of whether or not we do surgical site reduction, regardless of whether or not we do, uh, we do other treatments. Chemotherapy is the standard of care for higher grade tumors, but absolutely, there will be times when lower grade tumors will progress despite the other treatment options, and we will have to consider cytotoxic chemotherapy. Now, not to offend the medical oncologist, but in the simple surgery world, chemotherapy is pretty much poisoning the whole body in hopes of poisoning those cells more. But with that, unfortunately, you will have some of the side effects associated with the chemotherapy on the normal cells. So we really use chemotherapy judiciously in some of the lower grade tumors. Liver directed therapies, that's when we are focusing predominantly on the, on the uh, liver dominant or the life limiting disease that's within the liver. Liver directed therapies have been used for this disease for literally like 40 or 50 years. The platforms have gotten a lot better the response rate is extremely high in neuroendocrine, probably over 80% likelihood of getting an appreciable response with liver-directed therapies. So as Dr. Blakely said, you can't like go Braveheart style with surgery in the liver if you, it's gonna then eliminate the potential need for, for liver-directed therapies and, and the patient be less uh, uh, able to tolerate that in the future. And then peptide-based receptor therapy, that's the little car, and instead of the pizza delivery light, now I've got a radiation particle. It is driving over your entire body, looking for the same receptor. So therefore, we're once again targeting the receptor. I'd say it latches on like a leech. It's internalized by the, the cell, and it damages the DNA. So how I describe that to patients is it's literally like messing with the, with the engine, whereby your car may be sitting in your driveway, but it cannot drive. So PRRT, when it was compared to just increasing the dose of somatostatin receptor inhibitor therapies. So I say pretty much the Netter trial that Del Rivera talked about was pretty much um, comparing two things, comparing sending in more cars, raising the dose so you have more cars trying to find more receptors, that would be escalating doses of this, versus this, and this one, say PRT1, hands down, no, uh, uh, no argument. So this is also targeting the receptor, Excellent, but it's really often reserved for people that for whatever reason have progressed despite um, the, the other therapies that we're describing. If I were to just say one takeaway coming from a surgical standpoint, our, our program has always been the one that has, has sort of within the neuroendocrine community been the most surgically aggressive um, in, in managing patients, um, is that we have now become the, the um, the program in the country with the greatest experience in operating on people after having been exposed to PRRT. 
I would highly like not prefer not to have that happen. So if we use PRT early in the course, what we have found is that we will then have people that require an operation, and that operation is significantly harder because of the post-radiation uh, problems. And so I would usually say before we, we go into PRT, could we possibly at least get a surgeon to, to confirm that at no time do we think that this person would, would need to go to the operating room? And I don't want to say that it's, it's always going to be out of sequence. There are times when we've had to operate on people predominantly because of complications associated with PRRT or complications of the disease despite the PRRT. And so we have become very known for that. And then obviously surgery. And I think that's it. Oh, and the debates and controversies, these are just my questions, is is there evidence to support watchful waiting? There absolutely is. So, so I will not deny someone an operation for a really small tumor if it's really like messing with their mojo, but that in grade one tumors less than two centimeters, really the guidelines are suggesting that we should do watchful waiting and or incidental findings in non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, regardless of the, of the age of the patient. I think that there is a lot of data to suggest that watchful waiting is likely better than the morbidity of an operation. Is surgery for metastatic peanut associated with improved survival? We will never be able to compare that head to head, but the data is mixed. And the stronger data is resecting the metastatic disease compared to, to the primary. And what is the role of minimally invasive surgery in PMET? It's absolutely there. Standard for low-grade body tail tumors. There's no standard for locally advanced lymph node positive disease. So it's harder to do the bigger operations um, laparoscopically or robotic. And it is not standard for high-grade tumors. That I do. Oh, and this is just my advice, which is that you need you need to get a surgical opinion from a surgeon and not have it driven by um, by people and once again dr blakely rightly said is a lot of surgery is in the high of the beholder and so i just think that if, if your multidisciplinary team is is um uh, is truly a multidisciplinary team you have the surgeons that are ultimately giving you the surgery advice even if the advice is not to do surgery um, and then the interventional radiologist gives you the advice on the interventional radiology. The medical oncology gives you the somatostat receptor inhibitor things. And, and oftentimes in some of the programs where you just can't see all of those people, we will often have those discussions at Tumor Board. Oh, and this is if you needed to see all, the, all my videos where I um, talk about all my cars and receptors. <laughs>